I'm Maureen Conway. I'm the Executive Director mm -hmm. of the Economic Opportunities Program here at the Aspen Institute, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to our event today, talking about the good job strategy with um, Zainab Khan. And I just want to say a couple of remarks before we sort of um, launch in. Uh, so um, this is a, an event in our uh, Working in America series, and we've been um, running the Working in America series for a little over a year now, looking at a variety of different issues affecting uh, working Americans today, particularly lower mm -hmm. income working Americans. Um, and we've been discussing uh, public policies, private practices, and, and new ideas for thinking about sort of how we can improve opportunities for people who are struggling in today's economy, of which there are uh, far too many. Um, we'd like to thank the Ford Foundation, the mm -hmm. Charles Stewart Mott mm -hmm. Foundation, and the Certina Foundation. Glad to see someone from the Certina Foundation here today uh, for their support of, of this conversation series. Um, and um, I'm just going to start by introducing Zainab because I'm so happy to have her here talking about this, this new book. So Zainab is an um, associate adjunct professor uh, at the Sloan School of Management mm -hmm. at NIT. She's an operations professor. She's come and uh, talked with us before. And she's um, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful person to sort of explain all the business operations and, and make it really interesting. Um, and she's won awards for excellence in teaching, unsurprisingly, at both um, Harvard, where she taught before she, um, she moved over mm -hmm. to the to the Sloan School. Um, uh, I also want to mention that if you if you haven't gotten mm -hmm. uh, a chance to pick up a copy, the books are on sale in the lobby, um, and we'll hopefully have a couple of minutes at the at the end if you would like to have them signed. Um, let's see, anything else? Oh yes, um, please silence your your phones if you mm -hmm. haven't done that mm -hmm. already. Uh, but we will be tweeting. And I don't have the Twitter tag down, so Matt, you have to remind me. Uh, hashtag talk good jobs. Hashtag talk good jobs. Thank you. Mm. OK. Mm. All right, great. Um, so mm. with all of the logistics, I think that's everything. I will, I will go ahead and start. And, um, and uh, Zainab, so in addition to you know, your busy professional life, you have four young children and a busy personal life. So writing a book is a big undertaking. And, so what were your hopes, expectations, goals for the book, and, and why did you kind of take this on at this time? Uh, first, Maureen, thank you so much for having me. Sure. As you said, this is my second time at Aspen. The uh -huh. first time was great, and I'm delighted to be back. So thank you for, Glad to have you. for having me. And um, my inspiration for writing the book was actually the message that I wanted to convey, because I think it's a very important message that needs to be heard and also the potential impact of that message. Mm -hmm. So those are my two big, um, two big inspirations for this book. So the message is that in, in, in just one sentence, even in highly competitive industries like low cost retail, it is possible to treat your employees well, pay them good wages, and make a lot of money at the same time. <laughs> um, so how surprising. <laughs> so so, so this, is, this is the message, and it's an important message given where we are in the economy. Yeah. As, as, as most people here would know, many of the jobs that are created are low-wage jobs. Um, one of my colleagues at MIT, Paul Osterman, estimates that almost 25% of uh, working adults in the United States has a job that doesn't, that, that's below the poverty threshold for a family of four. So, so um, in, 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 this, um, in this economy, the message is a very important one. Right. Um, and, and, and I wrote, and, and, and the potential impact, so I wrote it for um, multiple audiences. So one was for those people who want to offer good jobs, those entrepreneurs, managers, executives, who want to offer good jobs, but they think that it's just not possible in their industry because mm -hmm. controlling costs is so important. Right. So I wanted to show them how investing in their employees can reduce cost mm -hmm. and improve profits if it's done right. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one, one, one of the hopes. And then the other one was for people who say, well, it's nice to, for companies to offer good jobs, but that's not the purpose of a company. Mm -hmm. uh, the purpose of a corporation is to maximize profits and deliver the greatest value to their shareholders. So I want to show that the companies um, that I studied are not charities. <laughs> uh, they're not doing this because uh, they want to give, give away money. They're highly successful companies. Mm -hmm. So they found this to be the most sustainable way to generate the best returns for their investors. And I wanted those skeptical audience to be conveyed by uh, this message. So that's, that's what inspired me to take on this project. Great. Excellent. 
So I think it'd be helpful because mm -hmm. you you go through in the book. There's sort of it's 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 not just a matter of making the job better. There's these practices that kind of work together in making this all kind of work to make it successful for the company, successful for the, for the consumer, successful for the worker. So can you sort of just kind of give an overview of what you saw as those sort of four essential practices and how they Absolutely. work together? Absolutely. Absolutely. As you, as you mentioned, Martin, the good job strategy is not just about paying employees more, but it's about operational excellence. And specifically, it's about four practices that allow pe companies to achieve operational ex excellence and achieve value to their customers, employees, and investors all at the same time. So the first practice that I've identified in, um, when I looked at highly successful companies that, that were thriving financially while offering good jobs was that they all offered less to their customers than their competitors do. So if you go to uh, a typical supermarket, you're going to see about 40,000 different products. If you go to a Mercadona store, which is, I know you won't go to because it's in Spain, uh, <laughs> but if you go to a Trader Joe's store, if you go to a Mercadona store, there are on, only about 8,000 products. Mm -hmm. Trader Joe's carries about 4,000 products. So, so all these companies I've studied carry fewer products than their competitors do. And carrying fewer products makes the job easier, faster, um, more accurate for the employee. Um, it, it can improve profits because it really lowers costs for the companies. Mm -hmm. And it can generate great uh, customer service for customers while allowing them to have low prices. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, so it works for employees, customers, and investors all at the same time. So offer less is the fir first one of my choices. The second one is standardize and empower. So, so many um, low-cost companies tend to standardize everything and give their employees no decision rights. So it doesn't matter whether Joe performs a task or Mark performs a task, they're interchangeable and, it, you know, and, and, and they're not making any decisions. While the companies I've studied, on the one hand, standardize all those tasks that would really benefit from efficiencies and consistencies. So there is one way to shell merchandise, which is the best way ergonomically, and it's the, and it's the most accurate way. So they standardize those, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they give their employees, uh, they empower them to improve those standards. Right. And they empower their employees to make decisions that work for their local customers. For example, if you go to a quick trip convenience store chain, there's a convenience store chain based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's a large one um, with a, a, around $8 billion in sales. Store uh, employees order merchandise for their stores. They know what their customers want, right? They, they have a better sense of what their customers want than an automated system. Uh, which can help them make, make great decisions. So Quick Trip empowers them to make those decisions. So, so, so that's the second one, um, standardize and empower. The third one is to cross-train employees. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> at many places, um, uh, many companies that follow what I call the bad job strategy, <laughs> the training is really little, and it consists of watching a video before you're thrown into the selling floor. Um, and sometimes during like Thanksgiving, you know, the Christmas periods where it can be quite challenging to deal with all those uh, customers. <laughs> um, so my companies cross train their employees. They spend, you know, time and money in training so that their employees can do multiple tasks. Mm -hmm. And that way, um, their employees are always busy. No matter, you know, whether there are lots of customers or, or not enough customers, they always have something to do. And one of the, you know, th those of you who, who know about low wage jobs, one of the problems is not just the low pay, but very unpredictable schedules and, and, and schedules that can change in the last minute. So one of the reasons for that is because, you know, in any service environment, there's uncertainty in, in, in customer traffic, right? You don't know exactly when customers will show up and how many of them will show up. Right. So, so retailers uh, think that, well, if we schedule people as late as possible, um, then we can better match traffic and, 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 and employee, you know, the, the, the number of employees. While these retailers, because they cross-train their employees, when customers are not there, they can actually do other tasks. So they don't have to change the number of employees all that much. They change what employees do. Mm -hmm. So this is another practice that works for employees because it allows them to have better schedules. It works for companies because their employees are always productive. And it works for customers because customers have somebody in the store who can help them, who know what they're talking about. <laughs> so that's the third practice. The fourth practice is um, 
you know, I, I talk about the uncertainty in, 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 in um, workload or traffic into the store. So if you have this uncertainty, you know, if there's some workload, there's some uncertainty around the workload, you can either have err on the side of having too few employees, or you can err on the side of having too many employees. Most of the companies that follow the bad job strategy err on the side of having too few employees. They're usually understaffed. While the companies that I've studied that follow the good job strategy, they err on the side of having too many employees. So they operate with slack. Um, and operating with Slack obviously increases the customer experience, right? Mm -hmm. It's great for customers when there are enough people, you know, oftentimes during the store and you say, hello, is anybody <laughs> working here? Um, but it also can reduce costs because employees do their jobs more accurately. They don't make errors and they can engage in process and product improvement. So here's another choice that's good for employees, it's good for customers, and it's good for investors. And, and one thing, I know I'm talking um, so no, much, no, but no. one of the things is that these four choices work really well together, and they work really well when you invest in your employees. Yeah. So you can offer fewer products to your customers if your employees are knowledgeable about the products and they can talk to customers about the products. Yeah. You, can, uh, you can operate with Slack, if you cross-train your employees, right? If imagine operating with Slack and, and just not training your employees and having them perform very narrow tasks. So if you have a cash register cashier who only knows how to uh, control the cash register and you're operating with Slack, well, that person will have nothing to do right. um, if there are no customers. But if you cross-train, then operating Slack, you know, makes sense because your employees can do a, a variety of other tasks. So these four decisions work really nicely together to produce operational excellence, and, and they work very nicely with investment in people. So it's really, the good job strategy is really a system. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, I think that so was helpful. <laughs> to kind of, no, I, I knew that was gonna take a bit, but I, I think it was helpful to sort of lay out what are the, what are the yes. four strategies. And you focus also in particular on retail, mm -hmm. and I thought it was interesting. Um, I have, a, I have a couple of questions on this, but I was just wondering if you could say a little, like, you know, did you just have a particular interest in retail? You like shopping? Like, like why did you choose retail as your focus? I used to like shopping. <laughs> you know, my, um, my, my cousin-in-law is here, and she, she, she could say I used to like shopping before until I started having children. <laughs> uh, now I have no time for a shopping. It really changed his experience. Um, but when I, when I was a doctoral student, the advisor that I was working with uh, was studying retail. Mm -hmm. And he said, would you like to study retail? We had this big project and with very promising results. And our fascination was retailers collect all these data. Remember, I'm an operations management person. Um, retailers collect all these data. Wouldn't it be great if we help them make smarter decisions? Mm -hmm. so, 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 so that's how I got into retail. But then I was fascinated by it, and I stayed in the industry. And it's, a, you know, it's the largest industry. It's the largest, um, it, it provides jobs to millions of people. Mm -hmm. so, so I right. kept staying in this industry because of the size, its impact, and it's the, um, it's the classic example of an industry that provides bad jobs. Right. So studying <laughs> this problem in this industry. And then I thought, you know, if I could show, looking at low cost retail, now I want to emphasize that I'm not look, I, I didn't study um, retailers that, 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 that um, charge their customers more for the products that they buy. I, I looked at retailers that offer low prices to their customers. And I said, if I can show that offering good jobs is possible here, then it should be possible anywhere. Yeah. So that was the uh, other reason to stay with, um, with retail. Yeah, great. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it is true, you know, we've, we've sort of in our, in our work and in the Working in America series, we come to retail, talking about retail so often because of the, of the quality of jobs and that it's been a growing sector and it's one that's sort of growing faster than other sectors and it's creating so many jobs, but they're jobs that are hard to live on. But the thing, but the other thing that sort of struck me in, in reading the book was, you know, you 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 have four retailers that you focus on on a lot, but you bring in a lot of other examples from, so from not you know sort of the the low cost um, grocery kind of retailers, but also from from fashion retail, from restaurants, from a whole variety of different kinds of experiences. And I and I realized like how much I see this myself in in my <laughs> regular life, and and how how much this influences. Um, all of us, really, uh, as con as consumers, and can you just talk about that a little bit? I mean, why, as consumers, 
you know, have we sort of been just trained to put up with that if I want a low price, I'm going to get crappy service? Or, you know, what, what's going on with consumers and, and how, how, you know, how should consumers be thinking about this? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because as a, a, as a person who is in, on the business side of things, I always looked at bad jobs and their impact on the company performance. Um, so one of the things, I'll, I'll, I'll just do it, I'll answer your question. <laughs> but um, but, but one, uh, when I started looking at retail stores, you know, a, as a doctoral student early on in my research, what I found was that there were pervasive operational problems. I didn't want to, I, I, I wasn't going to study jobs. That's not what operations management uh, scholars usually do. So I was looking at operational problems that happened inside retail stores. Pervasive operational problems, they were happening at unexpectedly uh, successful companies, and they had big impacts on sales, profit, pr labor productivity, on so many other uh, factors, and, and, and on customer service. So, so and, and, and I started quantifying these problems, et cetera. So, so these operational problems affect us. When I start writing this book, I realized they also affect us customers. Right, when we go to a, a store or a restaurant or when we talk to a call center representative on the phone, uh, when we are in, 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 in any of these uh, settings, we can you know, get very poor customer service. And that can bring us down as customers when we have those bad services. I personally do not take my kids to places that don't offer great jobs anymore. At least I try <laughs> not to because I don't want my children to see people in their most disengaged. I want my children to see people as their most engaged, in their best selves. And, and I want them to see that the society we live in is actually one where people are treated with dignity and respect. So as a customer, I started putting myself in the shoes of customers, and I realized this is important for, an, for, 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 for all of us. Um, but the other thing is, I, I wanted to bring out the customer point of view in the book because Often when we have poor experiences at um, service industries, we usually blame the person who is giving us that service, right? We get mad at that cashier who can't figure out that number, um, the jalapeno pepper that we just bought. <laughs> they, it's just taking them a long time to figure out what that number is, and you're thinking, how difficult can this be? <laughs> uh, but now, after reading my book, I hope people will realize, well, that person has to memorize thousands of numbers. And that person probably received a couple hours of training. That person doesn't make it, um, can't make a living wage. That person has such horrible schedules that she or he might be working without having slept all night. So, so, so I wanted <laughs> customers to see the other side and not blame the person who is delivering us that, um, that service. And, 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 and I want customers to be aware of how big this problem is. Uh, I, I remember an incident with one of my friends who was disappointed that um, her children were not getting the best um, treatment at the daycare center. And then mm. I said, do you know how much an average daycare worker makes? And I said, we leave our children in the hands of people who can't make a living. So, um, and, 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 and she said, well, but, but, but here it must be better, right? And I said, yeah, but even if you look at like the 90th percentile, it's pretty bad. Right. So I, I, I think uh, it would be nice for, our, for us customers to have awareness of how big this problem is. Right. And at times shop, shop with our wallets. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, so I think some of your examples on that were so good. I remember the store that, we, you know, found like it had sold thousands of more uh, t pounds of a certain kind of tomato <laughs> than it even bought. So, right, so like just because, you know, they think employers think they're making good decisions based on the data, but, you know, we find this in our, all kinds of work that we try to do in evaluating programs and everything. If you don't get good data in, it's hard to make yeah. good decisions in, in any realm. Um, so I wanted to talk about employers a little bit. I think, I think you know, I think if you read this book, I think you have a really extraordinarily powerful argument that, you know, sort of the, the good jobs is not some unaffordable luxury in sort of a globally competitive business environment. Nobody can afford to have good jobs anymore, that that's just kind of the economic life and reality and we have to sort of toughen up and, and face it, you know, that, that in fact a good, job is, a good job strategy is actually a critical component to being a globally successful competitor. Um, and, and you draw not only retail examples, but you look at manufacturing yeah. and, and other industries as well. But, but then you sort of have to ask yourself the question, so but if this is true, 
why don't more employers do this? Yep. And first, let me emphasize, Maureen, that I am the evidence is so compelling that this is true. I want to say, I want to <laughs> say what, you know, that, that, that it is true. Uh, first, you know, in my book, I focus on retail, but I give mm -hmm. examples from a wide range of settings, um, uh, from assembly lines to airlines. Um, um, but but the, the, the four companies that I've studied offer their customers lowest prices. They outperform their competition on a wide range of metrics, uh, financial metrics, and they give good jobs. So even if you look at just solely on the basis of financial performance, this is better for companies. This is a better strategy to follow. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is a better strategy to follow. And in addition to this, these financial benefits, there are two strategic advantages that companies can get by following the good job strategy. The mm -hmm. first one is, if you have an execution capability, if your people, if you have that culture of execution, and execution requires you know, people to, 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 to execute, <laughs> um, then you can, uh, you, know, you can really see strategic opportunities when they come to you. When there are changes in your marketplace, you can adapt much better to the, to the changes in your marketplace. And you can differentiate yourself from competition. Even, you know, internet is not taking a lot of sales away. You know, it, it's still small, but it's, it's increasingly taking more sales away from uh, brick and mortar retailers. It will be very hard to compete on price with the internet alone. Um, so, so you have to give your customers something else. Um, and, 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 and companies that follow the good job strategy will. So, so, so that's, um, those are the two strategic advantages that, that really come from offering this. So it is a better strategy. <laughs> um, and so the question is, why do, if, if it is a better strategy, why don't other companies right. follow it? Um, I think my quick answer now is that companies can make choices, bad choices, just like people can make, make bad choices. We seem to assume that companies are all run by um, people who exactly know what they're doing and they're always making the right decisions, but it's actually not the case. I mean, in one of my studies, for example, I found that if you increase the amount of people in your, in, in your store, the number of employees, you would actually make more money. So one of my colleagues from um, Marshall Fisher, you know, from Wharton Marshall Fisher and his colleagues, they found the same thing studying another retailer. I presented this research to a bunch of retailers and I said, if I were to gather data from your organization, how many of you think that I would find the same result? That if you had more employees, you would actually make more money. Almost all raised their hands. Like, it doesn't make sense. This is good <laughs> for you, why don't you do it? And here's the reason. Because the conventional wisdom is that paying your people as much as, as little as possible and treating them as a cost, just a cost to be minimized, is the only way to run a prof profitable business if you compete on the basis of low prices. Mm -hmm. And the pressure, so labor is a big expense in many of the service settings, and the pressure is so hard on minimizing those labor costs that managers end up doing things that are not even good for them. Right. Um, and, 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 and the other, um, this is not to promote my book, but, 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 but the other thing is that I think the good, you know, the good job strategy is not an easy strategy to follow. Right. There are so many different components that have to work together to produce this strategy. It's not just paying people more. And, and I don't think that people had a blueprint for how to, how, how to do this. So, right. so, so I'm hoping that this book will um, help them get there. And, 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 and finally, I, I tell this to my students always now. I say, you know, achieving excellence is always harder than achieving mediocrity. And I say, I <laughs> hope you didn't come to MIT Sloan to, to, to shoot for mediocrity. You can, you can make money. Uh, by following the bad job strategy. You can make money by even providing horrible customer service. But you can also make money pr providing good jobs, good customer service. In fact, you can probably make even more money here. So choose this one and, and take operations classes so you can <laughs> <laughs> you know how to get there. <laughs> All right, so you're not promoting your book, but you're promoting your operations yes. classes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, so, uh, so let's talk about Walmart a little bit, right? So there they are, <laughs> sort of the classic bad jobs retailer. We're, we're sort of debating now, you know, if we want to talk about a bad job, do we call it a McDonald's job now or do we call it a Walmart job now? I mean, it, you know, sort of, so they're sort of out there as our archetype regardless of, of what, you, you know, you might actually think of them. Um, and you have some criticism of, their, of them in your book. It was actually sort of... Um, it sort of amused me a little bit, your criticism of them, because it, as an operations professional, it's sort of like, 
I, th I think you even say at some point that you find uh, supply chains awe-inspiring. And it's sort of like, so there they are, they have this globally amazing supply chain. I, when I went to business school, Walmart was like this case study of amazing operations management and logistics and everything. Mm -hmm. And then they just blow it at the point of sale, right? They just get it in the store and then it all falls to pieces. And it's sort of like they just like, you know, burst your bubble with that. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about Walmart a little bit and sort of, you know, what you think. And, and, and could they do better? Could they do this? Could they do this? So the dropping, let me talk, can okay. I talk about the dropping the ball first? Yes. Because that's, you know, I'm so excited <laughs> by supply chain management and operations. And <laughs> it, really, it really is, for somebody like me, heartbreaking to see how things <laughs> fall, fall apart. I mean, large companies, they spent millions of dollars in their supply chains to get the right product to the right store at the right time. And then the product gets into the store and then it's stuck in the back room. It doesn't make it to the selling floor. Why? <laughs> because employees are not motivated, they, don't, they, they, they are not trained, or they just don't have the time to do it. Can you imagine? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't, it, wouldn't you be upset <laughs> if, 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 you, if you were on the supply chain side? And then, and then they spent millions of dollars in their information technology systems, and we hear about what great things they could do with their IT systems, but the data in their systems are inaccurate because they don't invest in their stores. I mean, you gave the example, mm -hmm. the 25% example. Let me just say, it. one of the retailers, this is another large successful retailer. And by the way, Walmart is not the only one. I mean, it's, it, 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 this is pervasive in, 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 uh, in many large chains. Um, they found that every year they sell 25% more medium red tomatoes than they ever receive to their store. <laughs> Every year. <laughs> now think about this. <laughs> because their stores have so many different types of tomatoes. So when you have a checkout person who received three hours of training, that person has no idea if this is a Roma tomato or a beefsteak tomato or whatever other types of camp Campari or whatever tomato it is. So she or he puts, oftentimes she, medium red tomato, whatever type of tomato <laughs> it is. So there you go, your inventory data is now inaccurate. So problems like these we were seeing in very large successful companies that are operationally supposedly excellent. Right. Um, so, so, so I think, um, yeah, so, 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 so even the large companies had these problems and that, that's what attracted me to study this problem. But there's no reason why these large companies could not change. Right. right. There's mm -hmm. no reason. I mean, they have to make different choices, right? The good, it's not just about making, uh, paying your employees more. So they need to make different choices. But these choices work very well together, and these choices offer excellence to both customers, investors, and employees. And I don't see why some companies cannot make those choices. Okay. So, so you mentioned investors. So you know, if we're on the sort of corporate <laughs> villain front, why don't, why don't we just move over to Wall Street and talk about? Is this, you know, so, because one of the things is, um, and, you, and, and one can see this in the business press mm -hmm. sometimes, sort of this pressure to kind of lower costs and, you know, are you paying your employee, right? So, and what analysts might say about somebody's operations. Is, is the pressure from Wall Street, is that a significant factor in sort of keeping companies from moving in this direction? Yeah, I mean, I've studied four model retailers. Three of them are private companies, mm -hmm. and one of them is a public company. Um, one of the private companies I've studied, Quick Trip, they, they, they have a bunch of values. So one, of the, one of their values is to remain private <laughs> <laughs> because they don't want to have the short-term pressure from Wall Street. So absolutely, there is pressure from Wall Street for um, producing short-term results. In fact, Costco, my only uh, model retailer that is a public company, Jim Sinegal, who was the CEO for many years, the co-founder, um, has had this pressure. And there were times where Costco missed their earnings targets and the street uh, penalized them. There was one time where their, their price went down by 18%. And Jim Sinegal said, I don't care. The analyst said, it's better to be an employee at Costco than to be a shareholder. <laughs> and Jim Sinegal's response, I mean, I'm not quoting him, but pretty much was, I don't care. Um, I'm not going to reduce the wages. I'm not going to reduce um, what, what I do for my employees because we're in this for the long term. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there is absolutely um, more pressure. 
it's not to say it can't be done. I don't want companies to use this as an excuse right. uh, because it can be done. There are companies that show that it can be done, but there absolutely is pressure from uh, investors to um, produce short-term results. And that's why I think uh, as we think about what we can do, we need to educate the investor community. Mm -hmm. uh, we need <laughs> investors to take more operations classes. But, <laughs> but we need to educate the investor community about how company, how, how, to, to understand how companies' operations work. Mm -hmm. So they don't ask them to do decisions that hurt the company's performance in the long term. Right. Yeah. So, 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 if I'm, so if I'm a company and I'm sort of been in this bad job strategy kind of, you know, going along, but I read your book and I think, okay, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to start, you know, what would, uh, you know, I, maybe I'm publicly traded, maybe I'm privately held, but, but what would you say, what, what is the start? Because you sort of have these four practices, do I have to do everything all at once, do, can I start with one and then do the next, what, what would you say is sort of, how do, how do I get from here to there, kind of? I think the most important is, and I'm going to re respond to this based on what uh, I saw at Mercadona, because one of my model retailers did not used to be a good job strategy company. It used to offer bad jobs. It used to be just like any other supermarket chain. But then in early 90s, they changed their practice, and they, they decided to become a, a good job strategy company. So, so change is possible. But the, I think the most important thing to do first is to make the commitment. Mm -hmm. the, the commitment has to come from the top, and you have to make a long-term commitment to the strategy. Uh, the reason Mercadona was able to pull it off was because their its president was so compelled that this was the right way to operate. And he had mm -hmm. to change because foreign competition was going to take away a lot of market share from them. But once make, you make the commitment, um, you kind of have to put these four choices, I think, at the same time. At the same time. Because, okay. because if you start with just, let's say you start with just offering less, right? If you start offering fewer products to your customers, but change nothing else, your customers will see that <laughs> you're not offering them the same level of service anymore, and it's not like your employees are engaging them, or they're not cross-trained. So, 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 so it has to be uh, done together. So, so is that kind of what happened like with JCPenney when they tried to get rid of promotions, but their customers were a little confused by that. Would yeah, that I didn't study. I mean, I didn't, didn't study, study J JC Penny, okay. but they, yeah, probably sort of like that. Okay, um, so let's shift and talk about the workers a little bit because you've interviewed a lot of workers at these at these, and and I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about sort of what you've observed in terms of the workforce at these at these different kinds of organizations. But first, are there just particular stories of some of the workers that you've talked to that really kind of stand out for you in terms of this work and how they think about it? Yeah, there are good stories and there are bad stories. <laughs> Should I start with the bad one? Maybe I'll start with the bad one so we can end on a high note. Okay. <laughs> the bad, um, there are two workers that really stand out when I think about the bad stories. And one of them is actually, I, I start my book talking about her, Janet. And she works for a large retailer. It's, it was her seventh year when I interviewed her. And um, she started around $8 an hour and she was doing a really good job, so she got several promotions. But after seven years, she was making 11.60 an hour. Uh, she's a full-time hourly manager, but even though she's a full-time hourly manager, her schedule changes all the time from week to week, and she never gets to work 40 hours a week. So she receives her schedule just a few weeks before, and, 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 and the schedule changes um, so much, and there are times where she's asked to work until 9 p.m. at night, and the next morning she's supposed to show up at work at 5 a.m. Uh, so her, uh, so her, a after seven years and, 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 and being promoted many times, she's making $22,000 a year <coughs> with this schedule, and she can't hold on to a second job. She told me every time I get a second job, I can't keep it because of my schedules. Mm -hmm. um, and Janet is not just any employee, she manages dozens of people. Mm -hmm. She is in charge of uh, a portion of the cash registers, she is in charge of the card pushers, and she is in charge of money order uh, centers that this company has. So she has, you know, she, she, she does lots of things, and, 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 and for that, um, she, and, and um, one of the other things she told me what disappointed her so much was she tries to do a good job, but she fails in front of the customers every day. She says there are times where 
you know, I, I have a quote from her in my book where, you know, I have people, customers on the line, and they're so angry at me because there are, you know, there are lots of cash registers, but only a few of them that are manned. The others are uh, empty, and they're mad at me because I can't get people to, 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 to help them. And she said, but the store is so understaffed. And there are people who can help, but, but, but they're shelving merchandise, and if I ask them to help, then they're going to be behind their shelving tasks, and they're going to get into trouble. So, so it's just the, the bad job problem from not just the low wages, but not just the bad schedules, but inability to do a good job mm -hmm. um, is what really struck me. Another um, young, uh, young woman that I interviewed, she said, when I got my job, I was so excited because I was a cash person. And I thought, I'm the last person that the customer sees. So I can make a difference. Like if I treat the customers nicely, they could, be, they, they could leave a good impression. And then she said, after a couple of months, and I realized how little my managers cared and how everybody else cared, and the treatment I got, I stopped caring. So, so, so those yeah. were some of the examples, the bad examples. But then my good example, I mean, there are, there are some people um, who worked at Quick Trip. Quick Trip is a convenience store chain with gas stations. I mean, who thinks about that as a good place to work, right? But employees there, when I asked them, what do you get excited about? What makes you engage in your work? And they mentioned the good pay. I mean, they have the good pay, et cetera. But they said, because we make a difference for our customers. I'm like, really? Their mission is to make their customers happy. Working at a convenience store chain, part of the job is cleaning the bathrooms, cleaning the gas pumps. But they see their job as, so much, as something so much bigger than this. And I remember the very first conversation that I had with the CEO of Quick Trip. And I'm usually, when I have the conversations with higher level managers, I'm a little bit skeptical about what they tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, because usually they'll <laughs> tell you something, and then the people, um, the frontline employees will tell you something different. But here, there was such a big connect, which was so impressive. But the first thing, one of the first things he said to me was, he said, look, nobody comes to a convenience store as a happy person. You either need gas or you need <laughs> drinks or like you come in a, in, a, in a bad mood. We just want them to get out in a good mood. Uh -huh. So wow. that's what they try to do. That's what their employees try to do. <laughs> so, so, so here are examples of people who not only make a decent living, but they find meaning and dignity in their work. That's wonderful. I think, I mean, I think, you know, we were talking about this earlier in terms of thinking about, um, you know, the quality of job and just how much people find meaning in their work and even in, you know, in, in all kinds of work and how important that is into, into people's lives. I'm wondering if you can also talk about, because, you know, there's, there, there's a question and, and um, um, about sort of how they h actually hire people. And I, I think that this has also been sort of, you know, something people, people talk about, about whether people can find qualified employees or how they find qualified employees or how much they have to invest in that. And, you know, is it that they have a different hiring process? Did you see that they're sort of a, you know, that they're hiring different people or is it that they sort of nurture them to be different people on the job or is it some kind of combination yep. of the two? Could you talk about that a so little bit? So is, it, it is a combination, but let me talk a little bit broadly when, when a company thinks about their human resource strategy, right, how, how, how to manage it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's again a system that works together. So there's the hiring, there's the training, there's performance management, and there's job design. Mm -hmm. And these four things depend on each other and they interact with one another. Um, so you could have, um, you know, if, 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 if you create a job that empowers, you know, if you design the job in a way that empowers employees, then who you will look for in making hiring decisions is very different than if you have a job that is looking for robots who will execute <laughs> the same thing. So, so, so these things really uh, work together, but, but the companies, because the companies that I've studied, you know, do, do empower their employees and um, usually don't use very high powered incentive systems. Um, they, they look for you know great employees and and not just for attitude in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we hear about how in service it's all about oh look for attitude and train for skills. Um, but for a job like uh, a you know Mercadona you know supermarket job or, or or Trader Joe's you know when when you look at the job and when you know that your people have to make decisions with regard to the merchandise with inventory they need to have some basic math skills. Mm -hmm. So, so when Quick Trip or Mercadona, when they do their hiring, they're looking for people 
who actually can add and subtract and multiply. I mean, it's, it's not, they don't <laughs> do a calculus test, but, 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 but they do look for people with, right. with math skills. They do look for people who have an, um, a capacity for hard work because this is very hard work. We, you know, it may not be obvious from somebody looking at this industry from outside, but it is really hard work both physically and mentally because you're managing thousands of products, you're managing lots of promotions, you're managing customers, you're on your feet all day long, and you have to make small decisions all the time. So they are looking for people with the capacity of hard work, good, good ethics, and for attitude too, because mm -hmm. they are talking to. Um, but once they have these employees, these companies also invest in their training. Uh, one of my examples, again, I'm going back to Quick Trip, um, is that they have a very strict training program it's, um, it's about a week, I think. I can't remember the exact number of hours, even for a part-time employee. And then they have a test after their training program. And not everybody passes this test. Right. In fact, um, it's around 72, 75% of employees who pass this test after training. So they've hired them for a week, and then they test them. And so that's a pretty big investment. That's, a big, that's a big yeah. investment. But then once they are in, mm -hmm. they stay with them for a long time. Man. So, yeah. So, so I I do a lot of work, and I know a number of people in this room do a lot of work with organizations that try to help people prepare for jobs, and hopefully help people prepare for for good jobs. And and what would you say, sort of, in terms of what you see, how you see people hiring for um, for for good jobs? What, would you have any advice or anything for those organizations about how they should sort of think about helping people prepare or apply for these kinds of jobs? I think if one thing I would recommend, I, I don't know if it's possible, but to reach out to companies and also mm -hmm. change the way that they design the work for employees. Because you can help prepare for good jobs, right? You could have all the skills that the employees have, but if most of the jobs are low-wage jobs where the skills are not important because the company doesn't use them, then what will you do with all these people with, 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 with the mm -hmm. skills? So I think we need to have a collaboration of industry and, 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 and groups like that working together to both create jobs that require skilled people mm -hmm. and, 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 and generate those skilled people. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to start asking uh, you all for questions, so um, get, get ready. But I want to ask one, la one last question. Um, um, since we're we're in DC, and since we have you know we have such a problem with not enough jobs and certainly not enough good jobs right now, and this is this viable strategy. Is is there any kind of a sort of a policy something that could be done to encourage more companies to try yeah. to to try to adopt this kind of a good job strategy? Yeah. So I'm not a policy person. I know. So I'm sure well, that in people in this audience have much better ideas about policy than that that than I. But I think if, as we think about the minimum wage debate, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes it's portrayed as if, if the minimum wage were to increase, you know, it will be great for employees, but it will be bad for customers and it will be bad for companies. That's what we hear, right? Then either there will be fewer people or, um, or, or companies will make less money or prices have to increase. Well, if, you know, if, if companies adopt the good job strategy, increasing wages don't have to come at the expense of either high company profits or low prices. So what I hope is if there's a constraint like higher minimum wage, uh, which um, makes so much sense, <laughs> then, then more companies would be encouraged to adapt a good job strategy. So mm -hmm. I think that constraint could, um, could be very useful. The 725 is just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> great, great, thank you. I think I saw a question over here. Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Um, couple, I'm just by way of background, I'm a uh, professor at a school of business and public administration at a local university here. And, but more importantly, I also was, oh. more importantly, I also um, owned and operated a small retail operation in fast food. So I kind of see both aspects of it. And I agree with everything you said. However, however, there is a particular issue when we talk about smaller retails, particularly in fast food. And um, what I tell people, retail, particularly involving food, is the hardest business you could possibly go into because there's so many variables you got to manage. And the default strategy uh, tends to be cost cutting as opposed to product and service 
differentiation. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is particularly for the smaller retails, the mom and pops, I'm talking about the mom and pops. I feel what you say, well, I think what you say applies, it's, easier, it's more easily adaptable to the larger retailers where they have the scale. But typically what I see with the smaller retailers is that in doing things such as investing in employee slack, you know, particularly when during non-peak hours, is a real cost. And usually the default strategy of mom and pop tends to, and particularly when you don't have demand, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the economy, in the local economy, tends to be cash hoarding, you know. And um, <clears throat> so I see three implications. One, psychological which I just mentioned, you know, which is convincing these folks that, hey, you know, that, that, you know, to go against their psychological urges. The second is managerial, which is, yes, you could have more people, but the organizational culture, you know, you could have more people, but if you have poor organizational culture, you know, more people, you just have more people adopting bad habits and doing bad things and whatnot, right? So you got to have the proper culture. And the Third implication is, pol is, is a policy implication, which you folks talked about. Uh, what I found was getting good people in the first place. And I know you said that there needs to be better um, outreach with uh, firms. You know, one of the things I keep hearing is these organizations, particularly retailers, need to go out and train people. But also, I think a partnership or a collaboration with educational institutions. Maybe there's something we could be doing at the high school level to train people on customer service, on math skills, all these things that you talked about. So those are the three uh, implications I see, the psychological, the managerial, regarding the organizational culture, and the policy. Yeah, and I'll, you know, the default strategy that you described in the small business is pretty much the default strategy that I see in large companies, yeah. right? I mean, the, we, we, can't, we, can't, uh, we can't afford to operate with Slack because cost cutting is so important. So in, in, in the book, I talk about how you can operate with Slack to cut costs. If you cross train your employees, right? If you offer fewer products. And, and the companies that I've looked at, you know, Costco, Trader Joe's, Mercadona, uh, Quick Trip, they are obsessed with cost cutting. I mean, you would be amazed at how obsessed they are with cost cutting. So I hope that this will show even small businesses, how you can use your employees to reduce cost, how investing in your employees is done to reduce cost. So, 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 so that's um, one thing. When you talk about the, uh, the culture, um, these four companies, the culture there is we take care of employees, we take care of customers, and we look at excellence in everything we do. That excellence has to be part of the culture from the beginning. If not, you could see people, you know, yes, you could, you know, have people maybe not working hard, et, et cetera. But that excellence, I mean, you would be surprised. The, 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 the people that I've interviewed, how much they told me, um, how the fact that they, their employ, employers set high expectations for them, how much of a motivator that was. Most people want to go to work to do a good job, right? Most, mo most people want to, to, to do a good job. So if you can create a culture of excellence from the beginning, and it's ha easier to do it from the beginning than, than changing it, I think um, <coughs> you could pursue the strategy. Okay, Bert? <laughs> Thank you. OK, I wanted to follow up on some things you said. You mentioned the. Uh, four attributes that the firms would undertake. Um, but one thing you didn't talk in detail about, you alluded to it, is what are the features uh, that make up a good job besides high pay? And I think you alluded to the training. But what types of other things do employers need to do? And then along with that, do firms either fall into a good job, bad job category, or are there sort of mediocre jobs and in-between jobs, too? Yeah, I mean, the good jobs, um, the way I, I look at it is, you know, decent wages, right, to be able to get by, um, predictable, more predictable schedules, and opportunity to do well and to succeed and grow. And it's not just the, the, the way you look at the job, but it's also these four practices that allow the jobs to be a good job. For example, offer less, right? If you offer fewer products, 
it's much easier for your employees to be familiar with them and to help the customer. That improves their job satisfaction. If you cross-train people, we, we know from uh, a lot of research that pe you know, people are more motivated when they do a variety of tasks than when they do a, a specific task. That's the motivator. So, so I, I look at the job, not just you know, how much you pay, et cetera, but how you can use operations, operational decisions to, 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 to make it, uh, to, make, to create a good job. And, you know, it kind of struck me too when I was reading your book that um, it, it's, there was sort of like a threshold, say, that Mercadona or Quick Trip started with in terms of the quality of the job, but it was also an aspiration to actually continue to improve the quality of the job. So they got better as the company did well, which I thought was interesting. Absolutely. Can <laughs> yeah, the, go so, so, so what I found was two different operating systems. One is companies that operate in what I call a vicious cycle which is what the bad jobs companies operate in. And one is companies that operate in a virtuous cycle. So the virtuous cycle starts with the mentality of treating your employees as human beings who can drive profits and who can drive growth. With that in mind, you provide good jobs. You have you know, people who know what they're doing, and, and you have enough employees on the selling floor. And that leads to great operational performance. When you have great operational performance, then you have higher sales and higher profits. When you have higher sales and higher profits, your labor budgets are higher. So now you can invest more in your employees, and now this virtuous cycle continues. So as a small business, you don't have to start with all the perks to your employees. But once you have this mindset, you can continue operating in this virtuous cycle. Mercadona didn't used to have uh, super predictable schedules at first, mm -hmm. right? But they had this mindset. And after several years of operating, they started giving their employees very predictable schedules. 85% of their employees are now full-time employees who get their schedules one month in advance. They couldn't have done this in the beginning, but the virtuous cycle allowed them to, to, to get there. So, so it's, it, it, is, uh, it keeps getting better. Yeah. JJ? Um, could you talk for a minute about, um, oh. thank you. Could you talk for a minute about the role of leadership in a uh, good job companies, uh, did you find consistent characteristics of the person at the top? Does it start at the top? Do you have to have somebody doing this from the very top? Or, or what's, the, what's the role of leadership in, in, the, in a good jobs company? Um, so the companies I've studied, um, some of them have changed leaderships. Uh, some of them stayed with the same leader. I haven't really analyzed the leadership styles um, to be able to tell you what makes a leader to follow this. But what but, but, but I found in companies that they were all operating under these, you know, op they were all using these operational rules. But I haven't looked at uh, similarities in leadership styles, but except for commitment to the good job strategy. Yeah, I was going to say, though, yeah, that you do comment about the values yeah. kind of yeah. that, they, that they bring to it a little bit. I don't know if you want to talk yeah, about that the, a little so, bit. So the values, so, so they have very um, clear values, right? The, the, the things about we take care of customers, we take care of employees, we look at excellence in everything we do. And they stick to their values 100% of the time. And whether this comes from the current leader or, or the previous leader, so, so it might come from, from different places. But these companies stick to their values not 90% of the time, not 95% of the time, but 100% of the time. Uh, so that is, I mean, one of my favorite examples of that is Southwest Airlines, right? They, one of their values is they don't lay off employees. And after September 11, while most of the other major airlines laid off their employees, Southwest didn't. And they stuck to those values. But at the end, they were able to reduce costs in different ways. They were able to enter different markets. And they are pretty much, they're the only airline who was able to be uh, profitable 40 years in a row. Mm -hmm. So sticking to values 100% of the time uh, allows you to innovate in ways that you wouldn't otherwise. Great. Uh, yeah. Um, I want to commend you on distilling your 10 plus years of research down to such a clear and concise message Thank you. because it's, it's fabulous. Uh, my question is regarding union versus non-union retailers and if you've done any study on them, if you see any distinctions or significant differences between union and non-union in their operations. I haven't. There are so few unions. <laughs> <laughs> I have not looked. Uh, I have not looked at. Uh, that yeah. I haven't seen that. Costco, yeah. Costco yeah. has a percentage, yeah, that's union. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I was kind of curious about the uh, big box model. So one of the elements of your model is uh, having fewer products, and, and market segments have gone in the opposite direction, hardware being a good example. So is, is it possible to do a good job strategy you know, with a big box model, which by definition almost is having a broad, you know, very large number of items that you're having to keep track of. So would you consider Costco a big box retailer? Um, I just want to know what your definition of big box is. Well, I guess I want to know your definition of, 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 <laughs> number, of number of items, but, but um, in a sense, I suppose Costco is, but there's also, if you look at a, at a Home Depot's or Lowe's, where, where, you know, they're not the worst, yeah. right? It's not, it's yeah. not Walmart. Um, you know, is there, is, is, if, if you want to be a customer and go into, I don't know, Giant, we'll pick another not worst case scenario, yeah. right? Uh, and have those 40,000 items on the shelf and all of a sudden there's only 4,000 items on the shelf, you know, is, the, is there a room in the model for an uh, uh, institution that has a lot of items on the shelf to be successful with a good job strategy? Or if you want to be sort of that broad supermarket type of business, is this just not a strategy that's going to work? Yeah, I, th I, I, I actually think that, especially now with the integration of bricks and clicks retailing, there is even more opportunity to pursue the, um, the offer less example and even specialty, you know, those stores I would, you know, the specialty stores, right? Uh, the Staples, uh, Home Depot that are, that, that are offering um, products in, in, in certain categories. It's not to say they have to limit the number of categories they offer. Uh, they could still offer doors, but not you know, 500 doors, but maybe 200 doors, right? So I'm talking about within each category to choose the ones that, 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 that's, that, that, that best fit your customer needs and, 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 and go for the first one. So the economics is, is, is very, um, I think the economics of it would work in, in, in those environments as well. And, and if you can offer shipping to your customers from your warehouses, right, from your online for, for certain items that you don't have in stock for a place like Home Depot, this would absolutely work. And in, in fact, companies like Home Depot, I think, are f trying to figure out how to reduce their variety in a way that, that, that makes the best use of their internet and, and, and bricks and mortar stores. Like, what is the best economics to, to do? But, but, but if you have so many, yeah, so that's. Zainab, hi. I want to join the chorus of uh, thank you for your work. Uh, Jody Love and Epstein at the Center for Law and Social Policy. I also want to thank Maureen for having you back. Um, <laughs> um, I want to give you a chance to play in the policy sandbox, even though you know, tell us quite clearly <laughs> that that's not your arena. In San Francisco, the City Council has created a new task force on schedule predictability. Uh, to deal with the Janets of the world, as you described in that story earlier. Um, if you were there uh, in San Francisco and invited to give some guidance to the council members who have brought together business leaders and advocates and others, what would be the steps you would suggest they take to figure out some solid government policy uh, to move this issue forward to help Janets? Again, it's easier for me to think about what's the best way for companies to move rather than what the, what, what the government can do. Um, but I think, again, if, if we impose some constraints on organizations in terms of what they can and what they can't do, then they would be more likely to adapt the strategy. Right? If there's a constraint that you have to provide schedules three weeks in advance, and any employee cannot work fewer than four hour or five hour shifts, right? If we have those constraints, then the constraints would encourage companies to, f to, 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 to operate in a way that's profitable for them. So, so, so I think those constraints uh, could help. I don't know if this answers your question. Well, I just hope we can get you to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. be helpful to have some good data on the um, relationship between a good job strategy and reduced turnover, um, a greater proportion of uh, promotions from within, and perhaps even a relationship between customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction. Are there data like that that we can 
use? Yeah, so in my, to in my book, I, I, I give data about the employee turnover at these companies. I give data about the customer satisfaction at these companies. Uh, there are some larger empirical studies that show these links. I have one paper, for example, that looks at the effect of employee turnover on, on customer service. So, so there, there, there is a lot of evidence, and there's even evidence um, that looks at financial data. So one of the things that I think we have to say is just to show that employee satisfaction is good or customer service scores are good is not enough, but we have to show companies that there is some overall performance benefits. We have the data. I, I think what we need is now commitment from people to adapt this. It's, the data are there. Um, in a wide range of settings. Now we need leadership to act on them. Okay, Barbara? Hi, Zainab. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> so I agree, there's lots of data, and the data are not even new. I mean, there have been studies dating way back, and we called it once high-performing workplaces. I mean, there, so the evidence is compelling, and yet the business schools that are minting a lot of the leaders um, tend to marginalize this point and also even worse tend to reinforce the other um, and you can take your class at MIT or my class at MIT and we get this <laughs> point of view uh, and then you take a finance class which is really at the core and you get a different <laughs> perspective so what do you think since you're not a policy person but you are a business school person and you've been at Harvard and MIT um, what do you think we can do to make this more of the central focus so that uh, the students who are then going out and being the leaders of these companies really have internalized and have this ingrained in the way they manage? I think first we need agreement among faculty. Because um, everybody likes to teach what they, right? Um, and, and, and it's usually a small group of people. And, 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 and so, so, so we need to be more active in talking to others in different departments. And we don't do that, right? We, we never have time. I mean, do you? Like, I never talk to. Um, <laughs> there, there, there are some people in other, in, in other schools that I know are open to this. And we need to leverage them and some very high profile people. Um, I know at, at Harvard, for example, D Dean Nitin Noria, his, um, he thinks about businesses, you know, the mission of the school is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. The mission of our school is, 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 is the same. It's not to educate leaders who will make money, right? It's, 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 it's to create great things for the society. Um, and I think the other thing is we need to emphasize is in a broad range of classes. I mean, I, I, we're not doing a good job. I, I don't know how, how to solve it, but I, at the end of the semester, it breaks my heart sometimes to get evaluations from students and to say, oh, this is the first time I was able to see how you can satisfy employees, customers, and investors all at the same time. I'm like, really? This is the first time? <laughs> You're leaving Sloan in a few months and you haven't seen this before? So we need to do a much better job on our side, and we need to do a much better job on our side to, to teach our students long-term thinking be it in operations or finance or marketing in whatever field. And we need to make your course a required first year course, right? <laughs> well, actually, you know, you know what we did is we, we made the first year course a required course to take my course. So now <laughs> Good. So Excellent. So they, have to, they can't leave without it. So. Great. In the back. Um, if, we, if we can show that, um, that be, you know, being a good jobs business will help profits, then we can go, we can, as shareholders, uh, raise shareholder resolutions that say that, that management is not living up to their duty to increase profits if they're not treating their workers well. Uh, do you think that that's a possibility? Uh, with, uh, because that, that not only, guess. <laughs> well, do, do, you, do you think that the data is strong enough that we can actually go in and say that you know, they're not managing their company well to maximize shareholder value yes, if they're the, not treating their workers well. Yeah, but the truth is the short-term pressures stay. And the other truth is that investors have a very poor understanding of firm's operations. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for them to know whether a firm, a firm that invests in, in, in employees, for example, it's very hard for them to know whether that's a good investment or a bad investment. They need to understand operations to be able to, 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 to um, to understand that fully. So it's, it's not as easy as, um, as it sounds, but, but we need them to be uh, long-term thinkers, yes. 
Okay, and uh, Nancy? Hi. Um, so I, I, I love thinking about retail because it's so, uh, it, it's something that touches all of us and we all encounter it every day. But I can't help but be struck by the parallels between this and this kind of study and the work that we've been doing in healthcare. Uh, the, the issue in San Francisco of the schedules for retail and service employees, it's the same thing that went on with nursing and staffing ratios. Uh, the same thing, even <laughs> medical interns and how many hours maximum they can work on a shift. So it's, it's all the same, and then there are studies that compare how that affects quality of care. So how this affects not only profits, but customer service. So I think there's a lot that we can do across yeah. all of these as well. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Thanks. Yeah, That's I was great. actually just um, talking with my colleague who runs the, the health program here about how this applies so much to healthcare, and she was hoping she could come and ask you some questions about healthcare operations, because I That's think great. it really does. Yes, in the back. Hi, Zainab. Monisha Hi, Kapila, <laughs> former student at HBS, one of the best professors I've had. So excited to see you here. Um, you talked about how actually a lot of the retail companies and the leaders you talk to understand this. And it sounds like the issue is coming down for at least public companies to Wall Street's short-term pressures. So do you find that the analysts on Wall Street who are really tracking retail companies, are they understanding this? And how is that influencing the way that they're rating companies? I'm not sure if they understand it, Monisha. I had a I had a presentation to um, at, to Wall Street analysts looking at one company in particular um, about a year ago, and I showed them all the data, and 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 after everything I've talked about, they said, "Well, but how do you know that it works? Like how?" And and <laughs> and, 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 and then and then they said, "Well." customers will keep going to these stores because they have low prices. And I say, okay, so their sales per square foot is this. Costco sales per square foot is this. Clearly, comp you know, customers are going to Costco a lot more than, 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 than uh, that store. And then they'll say, well, but you're just looking at one metric. I'm like, yeah, because you asked me a question about customers <laughs> not shopping. <laughs> so, so I think they are in some ways brainwashed for you know, seeing labor as a cost to be minimized and pressuring companies to do a good job in managing their costs. And we need to change that view. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your great research. I'm Thank sure you. you're doing the right thing for the workers is also the right thing for the company to make money. It's fantastic. I'm wondering if you have looked at all kind of historically, because in a lot of the United States for many decades, treating your workers well was kind of was the culture. You taught them well, the workers stayed there for decades, gave them wages. You can go back to Henry Ford s talking about his workers saying, I want to pay them well enough so they can buy the cars that I'm producing. So he understood it was economically good for him. Of course, he had other problems yeah. about how he treated <laughs> his workers. Yeah, exactly. But at least paying them well. So just wondering if you've had, I know you've got a full boat and four kids and <laughs> doing incredible work, but have you had a chance to look kind of historically at how often has the good job strategy been followed in the United States? When did it go off track? If it was the norm, what made it go off track? And if you've just kind of got a historic sense of how often the good job strategy has been followed. I haven't followed. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not a great student of history, but one thing that I, I, I do want to mention is what we're seeing now, we kind of saw it before. So now with retail, you know, with service industries, bad jobs, uh, bad customer service, bad performance, we've seen this before in manufacturing. So Henry Ford, one of his other sayings is, why do I hire, why do I have to hire a whole person when all I need is a pair of hands, right? And for a long time, the attitude in manufacturing here was, to treat your employees as interchangeable parts. If you looked at some of the assembly lines, like the er er earlier, um, you would see uh, people doing very narrow tasks, repeated tasks, and not having any decision rights. And what you also saw was a lot of quality problems, a lot of productivity problems. And what you see in this country, uh, losing market share to foreign competitors in a wide range of industries. That's where the competitiveness, you know, there, was a, there were studies in late 70s or the 80s about bringing competitiveness back to the United States. And that's when we learned for companies like Toyota, 
that even in assembly lines, designing the work in a way that empowers employees is good for the company. I mean, we looked at places like Toyota where things work, you have a great operational design and you have people and when you put these two together, the outcome is excellent and it's low prices, it's great quality and, and great performance. So we've kind of witnessed this before um, and I'm hoping that we're gonna witness it again. Um, obviously the problem is that we don't have competition from international companies when it comes to service industries because those jobs are here. So I'm really interested in the, the facet of the strategy that has to deal with um, minimizing product choice within stores. And I'm curious about how retailers deal with the pressure to expand product choice over time. So I mean, for example, I, I was at a food processing, processing conference a couple years ago and learned there that there are 110 varieties of hamburger helper. <laughs> and the people who produce hamburger helper obviously have an interest in selling as many of those varieties as they can since they've invested in making them. Do they pressure stores to accept more and more of these products? Yeah. I mean, one thing is um, they don't, so maybe I should say, they don't minimize variety. They offer less than their competitors do. So they still offer variety, enough variety for their customers to choose. And again, customers um, show whether this works or not by showing how much money they spend, right? When you look at the sales per square foot of a Trader Joe's store, it's almost triple the supermarket average. So clearly, customers don't mind having fewer products in, certain, in, 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 in all the categories that uh, Trader Joe's carries. But again, it works because it's complemented with so many other things. So, so um, it, it Southwest Airlines, Right? Southwest is another great example. They offer so much less to their customers than their competitors do. They don't transfer your luggage if you make a connection to a different flight. They don't offer you meals. They don't offer you business class, first class. They offer less to their com to, to, because they compete on the basis lo of low cost, but they invest in their people so their people can compensate for the less that they offer. So, so um, I think in any industry you can make the case that while well, there's pressure to offer more, but if your strategy is low cost, you need to make choices. And, and offering less tends to be a good choice when it's complemented with yeah, other Southwest things. Southwest is starting to look like a luxury airline these days, though. But <laughs> after the, you know, at, I have to say, I mean, after the merger, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. you had this example, I think, on this, on this product variety thing. So, so personally, like, I think it's a service, actually, that there's only one kind of soy sauce at Trader Joe's. Like, how many do I need? But, but you had this example in your book about toothpaste. I was wondering if you just want to say, because also about like, uh, like all the varieties. And you just May I, you know, it's again like this, is, this alludes to the fact that it's yeah. not minimizing choice for customers, but offering the right choice. There are 364 types of toothpaste. Toothpaste comes in so many different forms. It comes in different shapes. Toothpaste comes in, you know, there are different flavors. There's cinnamon, um, different mint flavors. <laughs> toothpaste has lots of different functions, like tartar control, whitening, <laughs> fresh breath. Even in the whitening category, when you look at one particular brand, there are so many choices, and you, you wonder, is this what we customers want? Is this what they need? Or are we just, coming up with new products just for, com you know, just for the sake of having new products. In fact, almost, the statistic might be slightly wrong, but about almost 90% of new product uh, introductions fail. As an operations person, this is a whole bunch of waste that can be eliminated. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions, so I think I'm just gonna take one, two, three, uh, all in a row, and then we can just answer. Um, as a person who is presently unemployed with a broad background and who would be enthusiastic about working in an inspirational, uh, for an inspirational employer, could you just list off a few more places that would be good? <laughs> <laughs> you know, not a lot, right. just a few. All right, so that's one. We're going to take two and back in the corner there. Um, You're assuming that I'm going to remember all this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, three of the model companies that you talked about are US-based ones, and one is in Spain. I was wondering if you could say something about the different contexts within which they're operating and how that affected their ability to, to adopt this good job strategy. And you know, is the Spanish company an outlier in the way that the US ones are? Or um, you know, is it such a globalized economy that it just doesn't matter? You know, okay, I, more inspirational yeah. places to okay. work, U.S. versus Spain, and last one. Have you looked at the difference between part-time and full-time, and how does the Health Care Act um, uh, affect uh, employers, and how does that trickle down to prices? All right, okay. an Affordable no, Care Act at I the know. end. <laughs> exactly. I can see a whole can of worms if I get into that. So I'm just going to say that the percentage of part-timers that these companies employ varied across different uh, companies. But part-time employment is not always bad employment. Um, if you're employing part-timers just so you can't give them benefits and just so you can change their hours all the time, that's bad part-time. But if you're also um, offering part-time employees for those who need the part-time work and to manage against traffic variability, that could be good part-time. I'm just not going to get into the healthcare because that's, <laughs> a, that's a huge um, <laughs> big issue. The, the one about um, Spain versus United States, you know, the, the four companies I've analyzed are actually all so different in operating in different contexts, right? Th there is usually, when, when I talk about them, there is usually a, an excuse. Like, if I talk about Costco, people will say, well, they have a different business model. That's why they succeed. Or if I talk about Quick Trip, they say, well, they were originated in Tulsa, Oklahoma. People are nicer there. So <laughs> <laughs> if I talk about Trader Joe's, they're like, oh, it's the products. It's, it's because of the products. Or if I say Mercadona, like, it's because they're in Spain. But there are other companies in Spain, but they're not good job strategy <laughs> followers. So they come from a variety of different places. Their sizes differ. Where their headquarters are differ. Their products differ but they all follow the same strategy. They all invest in their employees. They all complement that investment with those for operational choices. And that's what makes them uh, do what they're able to do, which is deliver value to investors, customers, and employees all at the same time. And about the places, um, you know, <laughs> I'll write you an email. <laughs> all right, great. Please join me in thanking Dana for being with us here today. <laughs>